Hello, I'm Ollie Barrett, and over the next few weeks, I'm going to be meeting the chief executives of some of Britain's leading listed companies and putting them in the driving seat. I'm going to be asking them about their growth journey, about the challenges they faced along the way, and about their plans for the next chapter. This is Ambition Nation. My guest today in the driving seat is Morgan Tilbrook, Chief Executive of Alpha FX. Morgan, welcome. Morning. Now then, Morgan, the clue is in the title FX Foreign Exchange, but for the unaccustomed viewer, just remind us the nitty gritty of what you're doing. So we provide foreign exchange services to medium large size corporates and funds institutions. Our predominant focus is helping clients manage the risk that arises from the volatility of the currency markets and how that can affect their financial performance. Right, so that volatility obviously could be pretty troubling for any FD or CEO, yeah. but just to remind us, what sort of transactions would they need you for anyway? It could be an international retailer that is sourcing its goods from China or Turkey yeah and they're selling their goods in America in the UK and therefore they're, they're buying in one currency and selling in another yeah. and therefore there's the, the differential between um, the exchange rates and how they fluctuate. So it's about getting more consistency um, and helping clients be able to forecast better their profits and their cash flows. And in terms of your own background, have you always been interested in those numbers, those opportunities, spotting those uh, different savings? Um, no, no, I don't think that's fair to say. Uh, my, his, I, Alpha was my first um, venture into financial services before Alpha I was working uh, in online gaming and a few other ventures. So it was more that I saw an opportunity um, and a gap in the market that, that we could fill. Wow, so there's that sort of sense of a whole new area. Were there people along the way that said, Morgan, what do you think you're doing? You don't know anything e about Everybody said I, I, I was crazy. I had no experience in financial services uh, and set up a business in the financial crisis. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty brave. And did you ever say that to yourself? Yeah, uh, do you know what, I didn't, I didn't. And I think that actually one of the biggest strengths of an entrepreneur is often not worrying too much about all the detail, because if yeah. you worry too much about the detail, it's kind of that saying, analysis paralysis. Yeah. But I think if I'd stopped and actually considered what I was doing, I probably would have scared myself out of doing it. Yeah, I totally get so, that, uh, okay. You know. No, that's very interesting. So you're helping companies who buy in one currency and sell in another, mm -hmm. stupid question. Can't my bank do that for me? I mean, where do you come in? Because you've built such a successful business out of the difference you make. In our market, there's kind of two providers, historically two providers, the banks and the brokers. It's more of an execution service. Yeah. Uh, and then you have the advisory uh, f uh, firms that kind of monetize the service by charging a monthly subscription fee. So we kind of sit in the middle where we provide the um, advisory service, but we also do the execution like a bank. Um, yeah. And and therefore for the client, it's a win-win because they're getting the, the advisory as a value add and they'd, they'd have to pay their execution with the bank anyway. So it's just a more advanced service to what the bank would give a typical corporate or, yeah. or an institution. 2009, yeah. financial crisis yeah. is sort of um, well underway, so to speak. You're starting the business by your own admission mm -hmm. now. I didn't know a huge amount about foreign exchange at that point. Um, between then and now, key turning points on the journey? I think fundamentally the, the, the key turning point would be at the start, how, how we formulated our culture and the, and the type of people that we hired and, and how we stayed true to that and recruited into that, that image as, as we scaled. And for me, the, the key is we've got a high performing team here, um, the, the front office, the sales team, mm. but we're client centric. Um, and I think there's a real healthy tension between being high performing but, but staying client centric. And, Getting that balance right is, 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 is key, and I think we've done a very good job of doing that. You took a big decision to list the business, to float the business. For sure. Tell me why you chose to do that. Fundamentally, it was to raise cash to grow the business because it was, it was, it was capital intensive, yeah. and the growth, you know, we, we'd be growing every year since inception, it already at plus 50%, yeah. um, and it got to a point where we, just, we needed the cash. Yeah. Um, but I'd say most importantly, uh, it was to retain control of the business. We didn't want the external influence. Yeah. Yeah, it makes total sense. Um, in terms of what else being a listed company unlocks, what would you, what would you reflect so, on? So I think the, the reputation, the credentials of being a, being a London listed yeah. public business are fantastic. It's definitely helped us expand our, our, you know, our counterparties. So yeah. we've got some, some additional banks we've onboarded, probably improve the terms of those banks, yeah. um, help, help us go into you know, 
foreign jurisdictions and win business there because it, it's, it's probably the best stamp in, in UK business, isn't it? You know, UK yeah. listed business. Yeah. And I think also, obviously, is, is, is sharing the, the rewards with the team. You know, yeah. collective ownership is, is a big part of our culture and enabling them to come on the journey and share the rewards is, is, is a huge benefit. And what's very interesting to me, Morgan, is when you say that, I know it's not just a token gesture, it's a really significant amount of the business. Just remind us, if you're able to, of the sort of structure of it, because it's very significant. Yeah, for sure. So it's probably just under 50% is, is owned internally. Yeah. Uh, and every year we, we have new share schemes that, that we put in place um, uh, for the team. And we also have some, some, subsidiary, some subsidiaries yeah. uh, whereby we have some other additional share structures. Oh. And it, just, it, it drives a level of passion and pride that I just don't think you've seen in a normal business. You know, people feel, really feel part of something and, and we try to make the most of it. And, and also keep people, it keeps people long term focused, you know, making the right decisions avoiding the path of least resistance and taking shortcuts. And a lot of businesses, it's easy to get lured into taking a shortcut. Where did that come from, that decision to really share ownership with the team? Is it something that inspired you? Is it your instinct on that? Well, I think it's, it's, it's a couple of things. One, it's, it's, it's a nice thing to do and, and um, it's the right thing to do, in, in my opinion. Secondly, it, you know, it drives a level of discretionary energy that you'd, you'd get from your people that you wouldn't get elsewhere. What a year to be having this conversation in, in terms of that mm. sort of energy. Um, let's leave 2020's pandemic to one side. Biggest challenges on the journey so far? Biggest challenges? I think as you scale a business, it's natural that complexity is continuously um, almost to be injected into a business. And we, we've launched a number of subsidiaries. We're now, we're now global. Mm. Um, how, do we, how do we keep that complexity at the door? Um, that's the biggest challenge because you want to stay agile. Yeah. Um, you want to keep your entrepreneurial spirit because that's yeah. what the high, you know, yeah. high performing people want. They want to work in an environment where they can excel. Um, so I think ultimately the, the biggest challenge is, is, is avoiding complexity because um, it breeds complacency. And so um, as we scale, we need to always look for, for ways to simplify mm. and keep getting the basics right. So let's, let's reflect on 2020, um, a global pandemic. Just talk us through some of the biggest challenges and how you responded to them. I think the, the biggest challenge would have been for us um, understanding our credit environment. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's a very different environment now um, and the world's changing uh, rapidly. And just say what you mean by our credit environment. So we, we provide FX facilities to our clients yeah. and, and if a client was to go into administration then you know, we can be left with a, with a, with a loss. exposure, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you know, having to review our client base and understand which clients maybe we want to reduce our exposure to or which ones we want to increase our exposure to um, has been a, you know, big, a big, big task. Um, but we're comfortable with that, we're happy. Um, with, with, with that work now that's been conducted. And of course, you know, you know hel helping people get through this, our team yeah. uh, and our clients uh, has, been, has, has been a key focus and the, the, um, how quick we have to adopt new technologies. Yeah. Um, but there's benefits, there's unintended, unintended consequences that have come out of COVID and I genuinely feel we're a stronger and better business because mm. of it. Give me more of a sense of how the culture of the business is evolving. It sounds like uh, this year in particular has had a big effect on that. What, what, what do you sense changing? To start with, a culture um, grows with a business um, and you need, to, you need to stay true to it and protect mm. it. But in a, in, a, in a time like now, it was important to speak to the wider team and find mm. out what they like about the culture, what they don't like about the culture. Mm. Uh, and, and I think for, for a high growth, high tempo business for the last 10 years, COVID was almost an opportunity for things just to slow down a bit and actually to listen to our staff and, mm. and get some insights. So we've definitely used this time to, to understand our, our team better and, and make sure our culture is going in the right direction. I just have a specific question on culture because when an entrepreneur starts a business, you've got a blank sheet of paper. Mm. So how do you even go about saying, this is what I'd like? Do you make it up? Do you get it from somewhere else? I think it's principle based. I think, I think a culture is naturally formed by the founders and, and, and they will often be based on what those founders think is right or wrong. Mm. Uh, and I think the difference between a business that ends up with a great culture or, or, or an average culture is, is the ones that stay true as they scale. They don't yeah. compromise, take shortcuts. Um, and it's been a challenge over, over the years because you know, we've hired great people that we've had to let go because they've, they've been, a, I call it a drain. You know? Those employees can be good, good employees that generate revenue for the business. Yeah. Um, or, or, or the operations team that you know, seems to just rile people the wrong way. So yeah. I think you, you, have to be, you, have to be, you have to be firm in not compromising on, on, on your principles. Yeah. But I think that's a fascinating insight because so much of your business is so finely tuned to what numbers say. And yet a lot of what you're saying is very finely tuned to personalities and how they uh, interact with each other. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I genuinely believe that um, we have one of the best sales teams around. Mm. Um, if we were 
to sell double glazing would be the best double glazing sales firm in the world. <laughs> I, I genuinely believe that. Um, but I think what's most important is that we actually have a humble team yeah. and high performing people and humility is a rare commodity. Uh, and but as a team, yeah. um, you know, a team of people that are high performing and humble is, is even rarer. I'm very interested about a business born in a financial crisis, so much uncertainty today. How have you seen attitudes to foreign exchange changing over the last year? Appetite for taking calculated risks? What do you notice? I think we, no we noticed in the last quarter of, of, of our first half of the year, which is Q2 calendar year, um, that clients are doing less forward, less hedging. Mm -hmm. um, and, and do more spot, and that's because they simply had less forecastability um, of their expenses or income. And more spot, what's another way of saying so that? So spot is converted currency today, so you've yeah. got cash today you want to convert. Yeah. Um, forward is booking trades in the future to convert future revenues or, yeah. or expenses. So we, we've seen some businesses reduce some of their hedging um, of, of their future, future yeah. forecasted income. Uh, uh, and is that linked to their sense of uncertainty? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Businesses have got less, less visibility in this climate. Um, some businesses have got more because of the nature of the, the, the industry they're in. But it, it, it's a balance. So our job is supporting clients to basically ensure that when they are hedging and, 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 and taking products out to protect their, their volatility, that it, it's, in, it's, it's, it's aligned to their, to their business needs and requirements. And that's yeah. a very difficult challenge in, in, in this climate. Mm. Let's think so. about that sort of responsibility because there is a sense that the way people think about what would be called ESG, environmental social governance, mm. is evolving. And I just wonder, well, let's go closer to home for the mm. business in terms of some of your own reflections, how you're processing. So we've now grown significantly that I think it's our responsibility now that we, that we invest more resources into ESG and, yeah. and we, are, we are definitely taking it more seriously. Mm. Um, and it's our, I think it's our responsibility as we become a bigger business to do so. Mm. So it's becoming a more of a conversation at, at, board, meet, at board meetings and, and, um, and we've got some great ideas where we can make some meaningful impact. Mm. I think for me, it's quite important that whatever we do, it actually it makes a difference. Because so. you're, you're, you're very well placed because of the core of the business um, to measure whatever you want to measure, to tune into mm. those numbers. And there can be a suspicion that some ESG conversations are a bit fluffy, a bit woolly. What's your take some, on measurement there? Some probably are. Um, but it goes back to my point earlier. I think what we want to do needs to be meaningful. It doesn't want to be fl fluffy and, yeah. uh, 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 and virtue signaling. And you are right. I think there probably is a lot of people that are box ticking out there. So, uh, you know, that's not alpha style. So, yeah. you know, we, you know we, we take it seriously and we're increasing the rate of um, women, for example, in our sales team as well as our tech team at quite yeah. a rapid rate. And we're pleased about that. But obviously we, we need to do more than that. We need to go further. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll, look, we'll definitely look to do that. Fantastic. And um, give us a sense of what the next five years looks like for Alpha FX. You've had an extraordinary journey so far. What do you see? I think, to be honest with you, I'm not going to nail myself to the post in regards to what exactly we'll be doing in five years, because I think the world evolves at such a rapid pace. Yeah. I think what I do know is, is that we will be cash rich, debt free, uh, we'll remain profitable and, and, and protect our culture at all costs. So I think if you, if you focus on, on, on having the right platform, yeah. whatever we're doing in the future, we'll be winning. And if we're winning, we'll be having fun and we can reward people and invest in ESG. We're in a very strong position financially. We've got a great culture. So, yeah. you know, moving into the latter stages of COVID is, is, is an opportunity for us to, to grow our business potentially yeah. faster than other businesses that aren't you know, placed as well as we are. And how about for you personally, you're in the driving seat of the business, biggest challenge that you face as a leader? Biggest challenge as a leader. I think continually evolving my role. Uh -huh. um, I think COVID actually has been a really good, um, process for me having some you know a couple of months from home to, to to reflect and think about what the business needs for me as a leader and i'm mm. definitely pivoting my time towards areas where i think my strengths lie and where the business needs me the most mm. um and you know I'm, I'm looking forward to that i think you know for me it's about strategic direction right. and culture you have a co-founder in the business i do yes so give me a top tip for a healthy co-founder relationship. Co-founder, don't fall out. <laughs> we've we've generally never never fallen out. I'm sure we've had a few a few cross words with each other, but I think being open, transparent, when you have got when you have got something on your mind or something that's irritating you, just get it out. Don't sit on it. Uh, I think. So having, you're not saying avoid having tough conversations. No, I think that, that's I think culturally that you know we call it you know radical candor is a principle um, formed in America. And, uh, that's and, interesting. Say what it means. Radical candor. It just means being radically candid so you know speak what's on your mind um, and you know don't say things that are going to hurt people but you need to be honest you are clearly driving this business um, what would you say is driving you um, 
the rest of the business. <laughs> uh, I, what motivates me uh, and, and drives me, I genuinely think seeing, seeing other people share the rewards at Alpha and, and continuing the growth story. I've got a lot, a lot of, a lot of, I'm a proud man and I feel it's important to deliver to stakeholders internally, externally. And, and for me, it's, it's the sustainability of the business, continue to diversify, continue to strengthen. Because at one point I will step away, mm. not for a long time. I, mm. I, I love the business, I really do. Um, but when I do, whether it's in 10, 20 years time, I want to make sure I step away leaving a, a, a platform that's highly sustainable and can continue to grow into the future and look after the people that, that work here and continue to deliver to stakeholders, both internally and externally. Morgan, I'm going to take you back to two moments in your life and ask you to give your previous self a piece of advice. The first day we're going back to is the okay. day you started Alpha FX. Piece of advice. Cool. Um, read more. Wow. I think read more and probably find um, a few more coaches quicker, people that I can learn from. Really powerful advice. Mm. The second day we'll just go back to you very briefly is the day you floated the business. Huge mm. expectation, an amazing life ahead. What do you say to yourself? Um, I, th I was more concerned about delivering the numbers. Uh, I was straight on to worrying about growing the business. You know, I obviously had, we, we enjoyed the we enjoyed the the moment, and we definitely had a few drinks. But you know, I, was, I think I was first in the office the next day, and it was it was back to work and let's grow this business and lead and lead from the front. And you know, it's, you know, I've got, I've got an amazing team. I'm, I'm I'm blessed to have the team team that I have and uh, or we have as a team. And but yeah, it was it was it was back back to work and you know on to, onto the onto the on to the next thing. Yeah, well, you're on an incredible journey and in your own words, great ambitions and tiny egos. And it's really refreshing to see that firsthand. Morgan Tilbrook, thank you for being in the driving seat. Yeah, thanks for your time. Thank you.